Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Oxford Area School District Board of Directors regular meeting. Today is February 22nd, 2022. It is slightly after 7 p.m. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Roll call, Mr. Cooney. Certainly. Ms. Harrison. Present. Mr. Claus. Here. Mr. Robinson. Here. Mr. Ty. Here. Ms. Dean. Here. Ms. Case. Here. Mr. Patterson. Here. Mr. Tenga. Here. Mr. Blessington. Present. All present. We have quorum. Thank you, Mr. Cooney. Approval of the agenda. Be it resolved that the Oxford Area Board of Directors hereby approves the February 22nd, 2022 agenda as presented. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Is there any public comment concerning items on the agenda? Ms. Warren. Good evening. Is this one? My name is Jennifer Warren and I reside in Elk Township. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I wish to comment on agenda item 5E, the health and safety plan. Revi revising this document is well within your rights and given the current state of the pandemic is maybe warranted. I do, however, have concerns about the extent of the re revisions and whether they put Oxford area school districts allotted $6.4 million ESSER three funds in jeopardy. Failing to receive those funds would be extremely detrimental to the district and its residents and here's why. Pennsylvania relies more heavily than most other states on local taxes property taxes instead of state funds to fund public education. This practice works well in communities with robust tax bases where communities can easily raise the needed funding. However, in those communities who lack a robust tax base, like Oxford, the needed funds cannot be raised even though a very high local tax effort uh, may be uh, used. According to Professor Matthew Kelly from Pennsylvania State University, in a report he created for the court for the current school funding lawsuit, an adequacy gap exists for numerous P uh, Pennsylvania school districts. An adequacy gap is defined as the gulf between the funds districts are able to raise and the Pennsylvania benchmark for the fundings needed to educate students to state standards. Oxford Area School District ranks in the 100 most under-resourced school districts in Pennsylvania. And according to Dr. Kelly, our adequacy gap is over $29 million short of the Pennsylvania benchmark for fund the funding that is needed to educate the most, most students to the basic adequacy. Or to put another way, the average Oxford student is shortchanged just over $7,000 per student annually. The only other school district with a higher adequacy gap in the entire Commonwealth is Reading. I want to stress that this is not due to any fault of the district. This is just how Pennsylvania funds its schools. Furthermore, our status as a low wealth district allows for our Act 1 index to consistently be adjusted higher than the state Act 1 index. For the upcoming 22-23 school year, our adjusted index is the highest Act 1 index in Chester County. So in other words, local property taxes can, and some would argue should, be raised higher than other districts in an attempt to close some of the gap. Given these two realities, the $6.4 million in additional funding would be extremely beneficial to our district. Now, I have not read the proposed revisions you are voting on tonight, as they are not made public. So I don't know how much they changed the document in the end. But I've listened to board members discuss the revisions at previous meetings, and I've heard threats leveled at the board by some in our community if drastic changes are not made. Consequently, 
During the discussion of the agenda item tonight, I would like to hear clearly stated an answer to the following question. Do these revisions in any way pose a threat to Oxford Area School District receiving ESSER three funds? If the answer is no, then I have no more questions. But if the answer is yes, I would like for board members who support these revisions to tell the taxpayers in this room, watching live at home and on video later, how you propose to find $6.4 million so the burden of losing those funds is not borne on the back of the taxpayers through drastically higher taxes or students through a dramatic cut in programming or staffing which will result in further learning loss. And finally, since test scores have been recently put at the front and center, I would like to hear how you propose to work on raising test scores when you are voting, essentially voting away $6.4 million, at least 20% of which was to be set aside specifically for learning loss. In closing, if the revisions to the health and safety plan jeopardize the disbursement of the $6.4 million allotted to Oxford Area School District through the American Recovery Plan ESSER three funds, I urge board members to reject those revisions, especially if there's no plan in place to offset the lost funds. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. <laughs> Approval of the minutes. Be it resolved that the Oxford Area Board of School Directors hereby approves the minutes of the January 11th, 2022 work session and the January 18th, 2022 regular meeting as presented. Do I have a motion? motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Superintendent's report, Mr. Woods. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. <coughs> Margaret Billings Jones, Assistant Superintendent, to give her report. Thank you, Superintendent Woods, members of the board, members of the community, and educators. It's my pleasure to provide the uh, district with the report uh, tonight, as we have done every, um, every year. I will be providing the district with a look at our standardized data um, based on the PSSA returns, as well as the Keystone returned. Looking at the data, um, I do want to um, set the stage here that the standardized data is reviewed every year with the exception of 2020. As you recall, there was no assessment in 2020 due to the pandemic. To explore the educational gap that was created by the interruption in traditional instructional practice, we are taking a look at the data from 2015 through 2019 and also data from 2021. Keep in mind that the data from 2021 cannot be appropriately compared to 2015 to 2019 because participation rate was reduced in our district by 15 to 26 percent of students due to their inability to come into the school to sit for the assessment. All other years have a limited absence set by the state at no more than 5 percent. I would like to present by pre um, presenting some data through fast facts that were pulled from our PDE, meaning our Pennsylvania Department of Education Future Ready Index, to speak to that, um, to the district. Okay, to begin, Looking at this um, fast fact from PDE, every year um, we are given the fast facts from PDE as to what our economic situation is within the district. 
The Oxford Area School District currently has a low economic enrollment of nearly 39% district-wide. Jordan Bank, our kindergarten center, has nearly 46% of the student population listed as low economic. Elk Ridge and Nottingham have nearly 42% of the student enrollment recognized as low economic, with Penns Grove at nearly 39% low economic and the Oxford Area High School at nearly 33%. The state identifies low economic as economically disadvantaged and looks at the progress of this subgroup in relationship to the total student population's progress. We will see this later as we move through the data. I do want to call to your attention as well. I would like to call to your attention advisory that was put out by PSEA, which is the Pennsylvania School Educators Association Advisory. To begin our review, I'd like to remind everyone that the 2015, the state PDE aligned the assessment to the PA core standards. This resulted in a more rigorous assessment than the previous years. In addition to the change in the assessment, PDE or the state also changed the scores of the four proficiency levels, referred to as the cut scores, therefore making it less attainable to reach the higher levels. This resulted in a drop in proficiency measures for all schools across the state in 2015. The slide references the PSCA, as I said, Pennsylvania Educators Association advisory who explained the difference in scores prior to 2015. I call your attention to the last sentence in this advisory. The last sentence states, the new PSSAs and related cuts are explicitly designed to be more rigorous, making it noticeably harder for students to achieve advanced and proficient scores on the new PSSA in 2015 than on the previous test administered in 2014. I now would like to continue that advisory to explain the use of the PA core standards. And again, the last statement of this paragraph of their advisory explains why the 2014 year and prior is not comparable to the 2015 and after. Simply, they are two very different tests based on different standards. And you can see that in the last statement. The PSSA scores from 2014 and 15 are not comparable because the student proficiency rates are derived from two very different tests that are based on two different sets of standards. So I'd like to keep that in mind as we move forward to look at our data. Again, I mentioned to you that we are looking at data from 2015 through 2019 to look at the trends that we were accomplishing, accomplishing during that time. The PSSAs are first administered in grade three. Grade three scores are also attributed to grade two because that is the preparation year for grade three. We can see that all cohorts of grade three fall below the state standard in ELA, yet we continue to grow the student's achievement. Remember, 2021 can also not be used as comparison because the participation rate of our students is much less. We can see the size of the student population in 2019 is at 236 students compared to 2021 at 197 students. The difference in the number of students does impact the statistical um, relationship for the uh, percentage of achievement. In addition to the ELA, we look at the subgroups. Our district studies uh, the uh, subgroups of all of the student population. The state identifies four subgroups for Oxford. That meets their number of students. That means that this particular grade, every grade that is identified under these subgroups has a, a minimum of 40 students to qualify for a report in each of these subgroups. 
Not all schools across the state have subgroups. If they do not have 40 students that would fall into those particular categories in that particular grade. Here is the data for our subgroups as identified by PDE. They are IEP, meaning students that have an individualized education plan. EL, for students that are English learners. ED, what they term economically disadvantaged. And HU, historically underperforming students. You can see, based on this data that is being presented here in our grade three subgroup, that we are growing our students. Grade three math, again, under the state average, we'll continue to, uh, there's continued work to be done in grades K to three to bring the students to a higher level to be equal and above the state average. Green, again, on this slide is the state and blue is the district. What we have learned is that our students in kindergarten, um, as reported by the um, administration as the teachers and looking at their data, comes in, the students come in, um, not yet prepared for kindergarten. So keep in mind then we are to move those students by grade three to be leveled with students across the state. We look at grade three subgroups. Again, we're growing the achievement levels of each subgroup as identified by PDE. Grade four, ELA, ELA, uh, I apologize, English Language Arts. By grade four, the district advances the English Language Art achievement for students and we begin to surpass the state average. We now look at ELA grade four subgroups. Again, we can see the subgroups of the student population identified by the state and we can see that we are growing the students as we move through the years. Keep in mind, each of these subgroups and each of these uh, groupings by year is a different cohort of students. Math grade four, it lags behind the state. And in 2015 and in 2018, it surpasses the state average. So we look at factors that influence or affect cohorts, and that is the preparation and the composition of the students, meaning how well are they prepared getting into that grade, and what do they come with, and what knowledge they come with. Uh, the staffing, whether we had teachers retire out, whether we have a teacher that is uh, taking a leave, whether we have absence or changes in staffing, um, our instructional delivery, as well as our curriculum and our resources. Moving forward to math grade four subgroups, again, we take a look at the math subgroups and how they are progressing. In grade science, grade four, grade four and grade eight are the two grades that are assessed in the elementaries in science. And we can see this is the first time science is tested. The standards, again, will be changing. So we'll be addressing curriculum to change to uh, address the science standards. So we're re rewriting the curriculum to align them to the standards in science. Grade five ELA. By grade five, students are close to the state average and surpass the state average significantly. As you can see, in 2019, 70.5% of our students were proficient or advanced in ELA by grade five. We look at the grade five subgroups. Again, we can look at how are our students performing. And I'm sure you can see, if you can see the, um, the key as well, the blue is the students that have IEPs. The orange are the students with um, English learners. 
the gray is our economically disadvantaged student population, and the yellow is the historically underperforming. And I've carried that throughout all of our slides for your ease of review. When we look at grade five in math, they're near the state average, and they significantly surpass the state average in multiple years. Again, our group of subgroups, Math 5, achievement data identified by PDE. Then we move to grade 6, English Language Arts. You can see over the, uh, the spread of time, ELA is significantly and consistency, consistently above the state average in grade 6 reaching proficiency levels of nearly 77% of the students in a given year. Our ELA subgroups in grade six, once again, they continue to grow in achievement for all of our subgroups. Math for grade six hovers around the state average and surpasses the state average. Math grade six subgroups, we look at the proficiency levels and look to provide additional services to all the students, particularly if we see an area of subgroup that is not performing to the level that um, we would need to see them perform. Grade seven, ELA, falls slightly below the state average with one year above the state average. We then look at the grade seven subgroup and we identify areas that we would like to make sure that we're improving and areas that are growing satisfactorily. Grade seven math, it falls below and at times above the state average. Our subgroups, again, we look at for grade seven math. Looking at grade eight, grade eight falls consistent with the state average and also surpasses the state average for grade eight in English language arts. Once again, we look at the subgroups. And keep in mind, we analyze this data every year with every administrator and the administrators with their teachers to look at how we best can meet the needs of all students. Again, grade eight, math below, above, and with the state averages dependent on the year. Again, the subgroups in grade eight math. This is the next year that we test science, grade eight. Second time that the students would be seeing a science assessment and once again, those standards will be changing and we'll be addressing that in curriculum. This next slide I put together so that you could take a look, as well as our administrators, at the State and Oxford 2019 English Language Arts and Math Performance. If you looked at that first cluster of groupings, that is the state performance for grades three four, five, six, seven, and eight. Three being uh, the, the green through the blue being eight. The next grouping is Oxford. And you can see that Oxford surpasses the state. It continues to move up in grade from three to four, four to five, and it stays well above in six. Then we do drop in seven, 
and stay even with the state in eight in English language arts. That third column, cluster of column, is again the state, that's the state math, and that's grade three, four, five, six, seven, eight again, and you can see the state has a step down decline from grade three through state, uh, grade eight. The district does not. The district advances in grade five, it stays up there in grade six, and then in grade seven and eight, eight is consistent with the state. Now that's 2019. I also included this slide for uh, 2021, not because we can compare them, but the whole purpose of the data review was to look at the gap from 2020 and what the district needs to do to be able to move our students forward. And you can see in 2021 how the, the, the gap in time has affected particularly our, our middle school. Looking at ELA in our second as compared to the state, again, our grade four, our grade six, our grade uh, five, are exceeding the state in ELA. And in math, again, we look at exceeding the state in grade five and grade six and grade seven, and then grade eight is beneath the state. So we know where our energies need to focus in regard to the students and to be able to move them forward. I move now to the Keystone exams. The Keystone exams, they were not changed. Therefore, we have the data from 2013 through 2019 that can be compared. Again, 2021 cannot be compared due to participation rates. So I you know, caution you in, in trying to apply that. When we look at the data, let's start with biology. We have been below the state since 2013, yet we are growing the students and closing the gap between the state and the district. We were about 10% of students less proficient than the state in 2013, and by 2019, we were near 1% less than the state. We have analyzed the data and made changes to the science offering at the high school to build a more solid foundation in science prior to the time students will take the biology assessment. Here again, we look at the subgroups for biology to determine where we need to focus our energy and our instruction. Now we turn to the Algebra 1 keystone. This slide has a lot of data on it. The Algebra 1 keystone, you see Penns Grove, the high school, and the district compared to the state. You recognize that a high percentage of students out of the class take Algebra in Penns Grove prior to the high school. We can see the upwards growth of students, 90% or higher, are proficient in algebra at Penn's Grove. This means they are proficient in math prior to the algebra course at the high school that the remainder of that class will take. The district average, when we look at the blue on the district average, we can see that it hovers around the state average when we take into consideration the high school and Penn's Grove students that have taken the Algebra I assessment. We look at the high school subgroups for clarity to understand, are we meeting the needs of the subgroups that the state has identified? We also look at Penn's Grove to make the determination if we are meeting the 
needs of the subgroups at Penns Grove. And lastly, I turn to the literature keystone. The literature keystone demonstrates above average scores for Oxford since the implementation year of the new curriculum, reaching near 77% of the students proficient with continued performance annually significantly above the state average. We also look at the subgroups to make the determination, are we growing all of our students at an equal pace? And I also turn your attention to the Stanford.org national study on all school districts that note that Oxford Area School District is moving its students faster than the average. We will be continuing to program for students to close the achievement gaps that were related to the pandemic, as well as to grow the proficiency levels of all students in the district. We'll be looking to again this year, offer an extended learning opportunity into the summer months and after school programs to help close this gap. Additionally, we'll continue to acknowledge the mental health needs of our students and provide supports for all students. I thank you for your kind attention to this data. If you have additional questions, I'm happy to address them. And I also direct you to the Pennsylvania Department of Education for any data on our district, as well as the other 499 districts in the public school system of Pennsylvania. And with that, I conclude my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for uh, Dr. Billings-Jones? I have one. Thank uh, you. I, I do. Do you want to go first? Or? Go ahead. Um, so I, I agree with some of the progression that you've noted from 2015 onward, but just with, with all of the um, cohorts and age or grades here, there's significant erosion in 2021. Would you agree to that? In some areas, in, in some grades, and I think in some we, do, we don't have it. What's interesting is we saw some growth, in, um, increased growth in some of our subgroups, and that indicates to me that the remote learning with the one-to-one -one with um, our special populations of students benefited from that delivery. So we'll be investigating that further. Yeah, I was actually kind of thinking the opposite here, but um, as I just kind of scan through, it seems like either some of these groups have plateaued or a lot of them there has been some erosion based off of the trajectory that, and improvements that you mentioned from, from 2015, which, um, again, one of the says, I don't know that it, it's, big alarms have to go off, but I would be interested, could you just kind of mention very generally some things? You had talked about um, absence staffing, you had talked about um, mental health and things like that. Um, you know, th this is just, again, I'm just looking at things um, on these charts here without digging into some of the cohorts, but I feel like there's definitely, where there's smoke, there's fire, and there's some things here with the, the last PSSA on how we performed against the state, which worries me. So I, I'd just be interested, I don't know if there's some type of comprehensive plan that you're working on or something, just to address all the things that you pointed out, but I'd love to kind of hear as a follow-up um, what you're doing more specifically to address some of these declines that you've seen here. Absolutely. In regard to any of this data, um, as I mentioned, every building administrator, um, we, sit, we sit together, we, have, we already sat and reviewed this data. We look at what are the solutions to where we see those areas. Um, we are looking at 
um, additional math coaching. We brought math coaching in because math is an area that we like to continue to bring the levels up. Obviously, we, we see from fourth grade on that in fourth grade, they're still underperforming where we'd like to see them, of course. We'd like to see everybody at at least 80 percentile. But to move those students forward, we brought in math coaching um, and are providing professional development in that particular area uh, to be able to help move the students uh, forward in math. Um, in ESL, we are looking at bringing in additional ESL teacher to be able to move our English learners to provide them with the supports they need. With mental health, um, we brought in uh, two clinicians from Devereaux to be able to address that uh, mental health needs beyond our guidance counselors so that um, every building has two days of clinically trained mental health professionals available for students. Um, we, and it, it goes on and on. In regard to ELA, um, our ELA in our high school, um, they, are, they are working to get those numbers back to those seven, high 70 percentiles. Um, and we will be, again, convening. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that question up, Mr. Klaus, because I'm thinking we have curriculum committees in the district that are K to 12 curriculum committees. So what we do is uh, it's a four-year cycle. The first year we look at, we, we uh, uh, evaluate, we um, implement, we design, and we do analysis. So those are the four years, and every curricular uh, content is embedded in that cycle. So they're active in each year in one particular area of that cycle. That K to 12 curriculum committee is a live committee of educators from the classroom, one per grade, that meet together to go over the consistency of education in the district. So we will be looking at our data, we will be looking at analysis of the curriculum, and we will be looking at what else needs to be implemented. As we look, as I mentioned, science is coming forward, as we look to design the science curriculum again to align it with the standards. So that's, that's a process we have in place. It's really um, all the students are put first. We look at the progress and we do it in a very unified approach. So we do honor our commitment to kids first progress and unity in, in every step that we take in regard to student achievement. Yeah, th thank you for that. I, I love to learn more about those committees and that's kind of like why I wanted to start an education committee so as those committees um, are changing and adding value that we're kind of coming to the board and we have a formal committee um, first kind of just dropping in ad hoc I think that would be beneficial um, and then I guess the second thing I'd ask just with mental health being such a big issue here I'd love in a future meeting if you could kind of present again more of what is the comprehensive pan plan beyond just two experts being in the building? Is there, is there continued education for, for the teachers? Is there something that we're working to identify these students? I mean, you've heard about some of the tragedies recently in some of the um, surrounding school districts. So um, again, don't need that answer tonight, but would love to just hear some of those things. I think we're, you know, we, we get caught up on a lot of crazy stuff lately, and I really love to hear you know what you guys are doing for the students so and I appreciate that and mr. Klaus, a very short answer to that tonight is that we do have uh, student assistant programs and we have them in all of our elementary buildings we make sure that they're implemented there uh, we also have uh, a system that um, alerts the administration if students are um, expressing in technology any suicide ideation depression violence and we also have the Save to Say, which all the administrators will receive an alert if a student is in a crisis, and then, of course, the police are involved with us. So mental health is a priority in the district, always has been a priority, um, but we do fully understand the additional mental health concerns that are raised based on the pandemic. So I thank you for that and acknowledging that as well.
mine's going to be easier. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know in your, like, if you go back a graph, but you already took it down, um, the graphs that are just the green and the blue numbers, that's the entire student body for that scoring. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Tom. And then the ones that have the subgroups broken out are just the subgroups. That's correct. So just maybe in the future we could include a fifth category here that's not a subgroup, like just, total yeah, the total population. Um, let's and, and I certainly can do that. I'm just wondering. Just, all right. Absolutely. I just want to make sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Mr. Woods. Uh, we have no uh, visitors. Financial reports, Mr. Tenga. Be it resolved that the Oxford Area Board of School Directors hereby approves the following financial reports. The General Fund Treasurer's Report, Revenue Report, Expenditure Report, the Cafeteria Fund Treasurer's Report, and the Capital Projects Fund Treasurer's Report. Do I have a motion to approve the financial reports? Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Student activity and athletic <laughs> officials accounts, Mr. Tenga. Be it resolved that the Oxford Area Board of School Director hereby approves the student activities and athletic officials accounts for Penns Grove School, the Oxford Area High School, and the athletic officials account. Do I have a motion to approve the student activity and athletic officials accounts? Second. 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 All in favor say aye. Aye. Or I'm sorry, any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? <coughs> Payment of bills, Mr. Tango. Be it resolved that the Oxford Area Board of School Director hereby approves payment of the following bills. The general funds $2,827,556, the cafeteria fund $73,918, a payroll distribution of $1,792,809. Do I have a motion to approve payment of bills? Motion. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Reports. Report of Intermediate Unit and Technical College High School <laughs> Representative, Mr. Robinson. Okay, thank you. The CCIU board has not met this month yet. In fact, as you can see from the first paragraph of my written report, the CCIU board will meet tomorrow night at Downingtown. You will have to come back next month to hear the results of that meeting. However, I will report on some things that I had not covered from January's month meeting. First thing in the paragraph that you have uh, on my written report, Dr. Fiore expressed appreciation since it was National uh, Board Appreciation Month. He uh, appreciated, he expressed appreciation for our service to the IU, and we all received a uh, travel mug, it looks something like this, and it was actually filled up with uh, little candies. The candies are gone now but it, it is still a nice travel mug and then uh, the students by the way and when we meet at the IU almost always uh, the students from that particular school will do uh, some bakery goods from the culinary uh, arts program and they presented little cupcakes that we took home and uh, 
enjoy. Second paragraph, uh, the biggest thing involved from last month was Joe Lebisky, who is the Director of Administrative Services, who gave an update on the presentation on uh, the CCIU's budgets. And that will affect us because uh, as soon as they are passed by the board, and that'll be tomorrow night, we will pass uh, those budgets that we have looked at for a month and a half or two months. We will pass those tomorrow night. And then later in March, they will begin to give presentations in uh, the school districts. There's 12 school districts that they will have to uh, give presentations to. And I think in April, they, Joe Lebisky will be here in Oxford making uh, presentation on the budget and asking us to approve it for the coming year. And that's uh, just about my report tonight. Uh, it's very short, and uh, I, I think that uh, when the board members saw that it was actually as short as it is, they gave a little sigh of relief because I'm noted for talking too much anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Do I have a motion to accept the report of Intermediate Unit Technical College High School Representative? Motion. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Report of Chester County School Board's Legislative Council Representative, Mr. Claus. Yeah, we also met at the IU the day before Howard was there, but they didn't give us any cups, no candy, no cookies, so um, I guess I'll have to mention that in the next meeting. Um, but uh, not, not too much going on um, because legislators are pretty busy with the whole redistricting piece. The only thing I wanted to mention that in the governor's budget, um, there's one thing in there that's pretty impactful for us, and that's charter school reform, which comes up every budget but doesn't seem to pass. But the one thing on there that would be create a statewide cyber charter tuition rate, um, so it would be a flat rate, would be very helpful for us. The flat rate would be $9,800. I believe right now, Mr. Cooney, tell me if I'm wrong, if we lose a student to a charter school, I think it's $12,000 that we pay, right? And if they have some sort of IEP or something like that, it's possible that we're paying up to $30,000 a student. So if you think that we, if we lose two students, we, uh, you know, we're losing the starting salary of a teacher for every two students we lose. Um, so that's going to be very helpful for us. Um, there's also, as I spoke, you know, losing that $30,000 for that student. Um, they're looking at doing a more fair formula in terms of special ed funding for brick and mortar charter schools. So we will see where that goes. Um, and then the other, other quick things, there's a foster child in graduation. Uh, it's a Senate bill and that aims to keep students on track to graduate high school um, who may be experiencing homelessness or are in foster care. Um, and that just requires the school to have a designated point person for that student um, just to make sure that they're getting the care that they need. That has been morphed into Act 1 of 2022. There's also a house bill to change the district name, um, and there's some more things around that. That was passed by both the House and Senate and went to the governor's uh, table for signature on February 9th. I would assume it was signed with the, the bipartisan support. It doesn't really impact us. And then there's some, some training mandates that were unanimously adopted bipartisan. Um, which directs uh, the Joint State Government Commission to establish an advisory committee to study all the training mandates for public school educators in federal and state law or regulations and prepare an assessment of all training mandates in state law or regulations and identifying the duplicate fed and state training mandates. So um, it just seems like it's a lot of this is cleanup um, if I had to be overly simplistic with it. But those are the three things, activity um, within a commonwealth. That concludes my report, unless anyone has any questions. Any questions for Mr. Claus? Thank you, Mr. Claus. Report of liaison with Oxford Parent Teacher Organization. I apologize. I was told that there was a student representative here. Could you please just state your name and tell us where you live, or what township you're from? Hi. Um, I'm Elizabeth Evans-Ralston, and I live in 
West Oxford Township, I believe. And I am Borough? Borough? Borough. Sorry. I don't know. Um, but I'm the student representative for the PTO, and I would like to share what they've been doing over the past few months and what's coming up to look forward to. So in December, they had the Secret Santa workshop and the Salaxic Book Fair. Both were well attended and successful. And in addition, as a holiday treat and thank you for the teachers and staff all across the district, the PTO fully stocked the teachers' lounges with various drinks, soups, snacks, and candy. In January, the PTO ran a monthly Moe's fundraiser and donated the proceeds to the scholarship fund that was started in memory of Mr. William Ray. Um, in the beginning of February, the PTO honored the guidance counselors and the guidance secretaries across the school district for National Counselors Week. The PTO distributed cards and gave each counselor a, secretary's, a secretary gift card to a local rec restaurant. And today the PTO delivered soft pretzels, and today being that Monday, but the PTO delivered soft pretzels to the bus lot for National Bus Drivers Day. The pretzels were a small token of appreciation to the patience and dedication of our district's bus drivers. Tonight, they ran their monthly most to Taco Tuesday fundraiser, and currently the PTO is running their Gertrude Candy fundraiser. The fundraiser runs until March 4th, and if anyone's interested in ordering Gertrude Hawk, the link and the information can be found on their Facebook page, or you can email the PTO at pto at oxfordasd.org. Lastly, the PTO is currently taking orders for the discounted Hershey Park tickets. All orders for tickets need to be submitted prior to or on uh, March 21st. Over the last few months, the PTO has sponsored several happenings. A few I would like to mention are the PTO provided dinner to the teachers and staff over conferences at all of the schools, and they paid for buses for trips for the caroling at Hopewell, the Envirothon for the fifth and sixth grade. Uh, the PTO also helped the school store at Nottingham by purchasing prizes and rewards, and the PTO helped pay for their guest speaker who spoke at both Pensgrove and high school. A guest speaker who spoke at uh, Pensgrove and high schools. Uh, the upcoming information pertaining our upcoming information is the mother and son and the father-daughter dance, and they will be coming out very soon, um, the dates for the witch. And the father-daughter dance this year will only be K through eight. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, I've been informed that I forgot to get a motion second and approval of the report of Chester County School Board Legislative Council representative. May I have a motion? motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Report of Athletics and Student Activities Committee, Mr. Patterson, and go right into the Report of Facilities Committee, if you would, please. Uh, we did meet um, in the meeting. We uh, decided that moving forward, we're going to make sure that we communicate any sporting activities uh, to the community, and hopefully that will uh, help bolster some of our uh, attendance, uh, as well as reach out to the schools and have them uh, communicate to us any student activities that they have going on in the school. And hopefully we're not going to be redundant with the student representative information that gets shared at the end. So we'll evaluate that uh, as we move forward to make sure that we're not doing that. Um, as far as the facilities, uh, we also met. Uh, we discussed um, the uh, closing of uh, a bathroom uh, in the high school uh, to under and understand why that's happening. There was a, a water uh, heater boiler issue uh, in getting the proper temperature to that bathroom uh, that is still uh, in the works and, and being evaluated. Um, there was also a gentleman that spoke at the last meeting uh, in reference to why water fountains weren't working. And the reason that they're shut off is because it's part of the uh, COVID <coughs> protocol. So it's not that they're not working, they're shut off due to the COVID protocol that we have to follow. Um, and then the, uh, the last part was uh, just keeping our uh, gym facilities clean and staying on top of uh, the folks that we rent them out to, <clears throat> excuse me, to make sure that when they're done that uh, the facilities are clean for the next user. Yes, and, and we do have water filling stations uh, throughout the buildings. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Report of Finance and Budget Committee, Mr. Tenga. We did not meet last month. 
Thank you, Mr. Tenga. Report of Policy Committee, Ms. Harrison. We did meet and we discussed um, the changes to policy 7320 that is on the agenda for this evening. Um, we meet again on the 8th of March at 6.30. Ms. Harrison, as I understand it, the changes on that are just a second reading, correct? Correct. Report of board in service and board goals. Mr. Ty, there's nothing new to report here. Student representatives report, Ms. Wilburn, Milburn. Okay, so for Jordan Bank for this month, during the week of February 28th, Jordan Bank will celebrate Read Across America Week, and Jordan Bank will welcome honor students arranged by kindergarten teacher Margaret Wilkinson to read a book and do a related activity with each class. Jordan Bank will virtually host author Julia Cook, and this event is being funded by the Oxford Education Association, professional grant written by Kristen Schotch. On March 9th, teachers will participate in another professional learning session. A math coach will work with teachers to design lessons on the incorporation of a math discourse into the classroom. For Elkridge, Elkridge would like to congratulate their students of the month. Elkridge celebrated their Winter Olympics. Each classroom was assigned a, a country and tracked the number of medals their country earned on the school's medal count board, board while also learning about their country in class. The Envirothon team has been studying the state's natural, natural resources and gearing up for the spring competition. Elkridge will also be celebrating Read Across America Week by welcoming in honor students from the high school. For Nottingham, Nottingham would also like to congratulate their students of the month for January. Grade four students in Mrs. Famaletti's class earned the Philadelphia Phillies Baseball Fanatic About Reading Award. And the Philly Fanatic came out to visit the students with a celebration reading assembly. Grade four band students are participating in a jazz clinic. Uh, during the week of February 14th through the 18th, Nottingham students celebrated Random Acts of Kindness Week, and each day was assigned a kindness theme in which students participated in by dressing up for the theme of the day. After a year hiatus, the Nottingham Intramural Program has returned, and Nottingham is also gearing up for Read Across America Week. For Hopewell, the Dads and Donuts and Moms and Muffins will be rescheduled to a later date. And on March 21st, Hopewell will have their spring picture day. For Pensgrove, Pensgrove would like to congratulate Jaden Stoltzfus for winning the Pensgrove Annual Spelling Bee, and he will be representing them in the Chester County Bee. On Friday, January 28th, students were celebrated in a pride assembly for having Pensgrove pride, worthy behavior, and good grades. The last round of virtual or in-person conferences will be on Wednesday, March 9th. And any students interested in spring sports should be sure to get physical information submitted online as sports begin March 14th. And for the high school, the scheduling process for the 22-23 school year is beginning. An assembly explaining the scheduling process for current 8th graders will be held at Pensgrove on the 22nd of February. And there's also a scheduling information meeting on the 22nd at 6.30 in the high school for parents of current 8th and 11th grade students. And then from February 23rd to March 2nd, students will be able to make course requests into PowerSchool. To date, the counseling department has received over 170 acceptance letters to post high school institutions and military service. Students attend an, as an assembly on February, February 7th sponsored by PTO and Student Council titled Safer Choices, featuring Mike Domish, speaker, author, and founder of the Center for Respect. Currently, there are over 80 11th and 12th graders signed up for, to take the SAT exam. For sports, Oxford wrestlers will be competing this Saturday at the PIAA District Tournament, which is hosted by Oxford. Alex Carahalis and Ryan Topmiller have qualified for districts in swimming, alongside Noah Topmiller and AJ Hinckley, who qualified for districts in two relays and will compete this Friday and Saturday at the York YMCA. Spring sports are beginning March 7th, so a reminder to turn in Section 7 and 9 on the form relief. And in celebration of Black History Month, the Diversity Club hung up informational posters through the history hallway, reflecting on the important events and figures of black history. The Diversity Club also hosted a successful 90s themed dance where students were able to dress up and dance the night away to the best of 90s music. Additionally, I would like to thank the Diversity Club and all they do to celebrate the cultural differences that make the students at Oxford so special. 
Education has always been focused on preparing students for the future, so promoting awareness and allowing all students to create a personal connection with diverse cultures can prevent students from developing prejudices later in life. Furthermore, a research study done at Drexel University concluded that when working and learning with people from a variety of backgrounds and cultures in the classroom, students actually gained a more comprehensive understanding of the subject matter. While I cannot speak on the adversity that students within the minority groups of our district have had, I believe that as a student representative, I must be a voice of support for them. As a senior at Oxford who has spent 13 years of my life in this district, I am more than proud to say that I have been able to learn in an environment that promotes the celebration of diversity. I hope that as our district moves forward, we all make an intentional commitment to understanding and supporting all cultures, backgrounds, and differences that make our school district so unique. That concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Milburn. I do have a question. You said that um, some of the seniors some of the seniors receive military acceptance. Do you have a number for that? I don't, but I can get it for you okay. if you'd like. Just interesting. I find it also very interesting that you guys are considering 90s music something of an aged thing. So, again, thank you, Ms. Milburn. Report of school programs, Mr. Woods. Thank you so much. At your places, uh, you will <coughs> see a compilation of the survey to determine community input for the use of the uh, ARP. ESSER 3 funding the survey was sent to the community with about two weeks to uh, complete the survey. There were also paper copies for people that did not have access to uh, technology. Just going to go quickly through the questions of high level, the purchase of personal protective equipment, sanitation of education buildings. We had a 62% strongly agree or agree for the use of those funds. Second question, the continuation and purchase of items associated with mental health services for students and the continuation of addition of positive behavior management. We had an 87% strongly agree or agree in that column. Question three, the continuation and purchase of technology, hardware and software, as well as general costs to update systems along with the opportunities to present to parents on the use and understanding of hardware and software that students bring to the home. We had an 82% strongly agree or agree in that area. Updates and renovations to the physical plant or plants to ensure a safe and clean environment allowing for the continuation of education. We had an 80% strongly agree or agree in that column. Question five, continuing to improve the special services to our most needy populations in all areas of education and opportunities for the special populations to achieve in all of our schools. We had a 78% strongly agree or agree to that question. Next was the district will plan to increase staffing and resources for the classrooms and areas of need to benefit the students' ability to learn and process educational materials. We had a 91% percent strongly agree or agree in that area. The district will maintain and add additional professional development resources to benefit student achievement. We had a 76 percent agree or strongly agree in that area. And finally, the district will continue to add to the multi-tiered support system with MPSS <coughs> for students K to 8 and assess their advancement within the academic year to benefit students involved within the TSS program, we have 69% strongly agree or agree in those areas. So those areas encapsulate the areas that we uh, have applied for in the American Recovery Plan ESSER three funding uh, to the tune of about $6.4 million. And the dollar amounts will be assigned then in those areas. They actually already are assigned in the grant proposal uh, over the next two years into June of 2024. And that completes my report unless there's any questions on the survey. Any questions for Mr. Woods? I'd like to make a quick motion to move item D 
that would be 5D to be um, discussed before 5A, as I suspect 5A may take a few minutes. So I'd like to give the opportunity to put 5D in front of 5A. Do I ask for a vote on that or is yes, it? for a motion. Can I have a motion to accept that change? Motion. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And now a motion to move it. And now a motion to move item D to above item A. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Opposed? Item D, Eagle Scout Project Proposal. Be it resolved that the Oxford Area Board of School Directors hereby approves the proposed Eagle Scout Project for cross-country environment, environment restoration as per attached. Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? Do I have a representative that would like to make a discussion on this? All right. First off, I wanted to ask if I could pass out a copy of my proposal to each of the members. Hello, my name is Alex Waite. I am a junior at Oxford Area High School who is working on becoming an Eagle Scout in Troop 13. To become an Eagle Scout, one must plan and complete a project in one's community that displays their leadership. This project must be approved by the organization benefiting from the effort. The main reason that Scouts must complete this project is to develop leadership skills, time management skills, and take responsibility for the significant accomplishment. My specific project is going to be constructing four benches for the Oxford High School cross country team and removing seven fallen trees off of the high school property. The trees fell over when the tornado came through back in late August and are now blocking the cross country team's 5K course. After removing the fallen trees, I will plant new trees in their place. Additionally, the new benches I am building will be replacing the three old ones that are currently falling apart. These new benches will be eight feet long and partially made of composite wood. With the removal of the fallen trees and the addition of the sustainable benches, my team will have comfortable seating and be able to run our course once again. This project will be benefiting both the cross country team and the high school as a whole. I have received an estimate of roughly $600 for the total cost of the project. I hope to meet with the Oxford Rotary Club to ask for a donation and will need to raise the additional funds on my own. I wanted to thank the board for taking my project under consideration, and I plan to begin it in the spring. I also would like to acknowledge and appreciate my project coach, Mr. Schaefer, my engineering teacher, Mr. Haney, and my cross-country coach, Mr. Walling, who have helped me with my proposal. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions for Mr. Waite? Just wanted to thank you for doing yes. this. It, it's awesome. And um, can, can we help Alex, if needed, okay. with the facilities team with these trees? If you do need any help, is that possible? Yes, uh, and we can also help uh, financially after he does his piece with uh, the part that he has to do. Uh, whatever that difference is, we can pick that up. So Thank you. Mr. Wade, thank you so much for that. And if you would do me a favor, mm -hmm. shoot an email to the board seeing who wants to contribute to your progress. Okay. Well done. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. Um, new or old business, Mr. Cooney. Uh, Mr. Ty, I have a motion by Mr. Tenga, seconded by Mr. Kloss on the Eagle Scout project. May I? 
I'm sorry? Can I get a vote on the Eagle Scout project? Oh, I'm sorry, I have a sorry, motion yes. by Mr. Tangus, seconded by Mr. Kloss. Uh, any further discussion on the Eagle Scout project? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, new business. I've been asked that we can take a five, if we could take a five minute um, a recess real quick before we start new business, because I've got a few names here that everyone's going to want to speak. So um, we're going to adjourn just for a brief five minutes.
Okay, everyone, would like to reconvene the meeting if we could. Just um, just want to remind everyone, please, when you approach the podium, you have five minutes to speak and just state your name and what township or borough that you're from. We'll start with Ms. D. Weicker. Good evening. Um... One thing I wanted to ask was, um, I noticed in the May meeting that there was a suspension of Robert's rules. Is that like just for that meeting or is that like indefinitely? Are we still using Robert's rules or not? There was no suspension for Robert's rules in this meeting. No, May. Oh, that, I just that was just for the, um, the committee meeting. Okay. I wasn't sure about that. That's, That's why always I asked. for committee meetings, and, and well, not always, but mostly for the committee meetings. Never for either the regular meeting or the work session. Okay. Okay. Um, something I observed that I did not know if you were aware of or not. Um, on the website, the um, the treasurer's report, August, September, and October all have a treasurer's report that is dated for November and December. November 30th, 2021 and December 31st, 2021. Okay, um, yeah, all, all from August, September, October, November and December, all are the same exact report. Okay, just so that you know that. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is uh, we were talking earlier, somebody was speaking about um, money, and we have performance, performance assessments that I was looking through um, for the superintendent and the assistant superintendent. And um, I thought it was very strange that the three performance assessments that were up for the superintendent were all exactly identical, but dated different years. Not a word was different. Not one word. But they all had different dates. I have a copy of it. Um, and the assistant superintendent Hers is exactly the same as Mr. Woods. Exactly. No difference whatsoever. Now, I was on the website for the schools, and uh, the U.S. Department of State and their performance assessment, their evaluation for the, for the school superintendent, was 44 pages long. This evaluation is three, four pages long. That's a huge difference, huge difference. So I, I'm not understanding that at all. Don't understand why it's the same assessment three times in a row, no difference in wording, and why uh, the assistant superintendent would be the same thing. And I don't understand why this is, it, it just seems like it's, I don't know. I don't think that's a mistake. I don't see it as a mistake. Um, so the performance assessments, um, I went on greatschools.org. And I saw that our school quality is 75% below average. And our student progress is 67% below average. Um, district revenue was $65 million. 
but state average was $47 million. Okay, so that's a difference of $18 million. So people are talking about how much we need money, but we're talking about having 18 more million dollars than average. Now, when you look at the state average per student, it's $17 million, and the state average per, or the, 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 the average per student for our district is $16 million. So that's $729 less per student. Now, if you look at Miss Nikki Bolger. Hello, my name is Nikki Bolger. I'm a resident of Lower Oxford Township and a parent of a current kindergarten student. Before I move on to addressing Jennifer Key's comments during recent board meetings, I would like to point out that during the January 11th work session, Michael Blessington was unaware that we have six schools, as he thought we had four. At a bare minimum, board members should know how many schools we have, especially if they're sitting on a curriculum committee or approving budgets and policies. Please do better if you're going to remain on this board. In regards to Jennifer Key's comments, I want to reiterate that we are not mad that she asked questions about a policy, about taxes, about test scores. We are upset that she constantly referred to children as illegal. They're children. Why do they need to be labeled as anything other than children? Being in this country without documentation is not a criminal offense, and children are by no means at fault for how they arrived here. She was told multiple times that the school cannot legally ask immigration status. I would also like to point out that every home in this district pays taxes, whether the occupants own or rent, whether there are zero or many, living, many children living in the home, the owner of the home still pays taxes. When talking about test scores, she said, is it the curriculum or is it that we have a population of students right now? And then she was cut off. She also said, if we are accepting those people, those will very much drive down again additional numbers on our scores. The if in that statement tells me that she was considering not accepting them, which legality aside, how can any human decide they want to deny a child an education? She was putting test scores above living, breathing children in our district who need an education. All kids are more than test scores. As a taxpayer, I want every child, no matter how they arrived here, to receive the help and education that they need if it means that my child receives a few less programs in school, so be it. My child is very privileged, as am I, as are most of us, compared to the families that decided it was best to uproot their lives and risk everything to get their kids a better life in our, this country. Have some empathy. My young son was very proud that they are teaching his friend and classmate English, and it warmed my heart to see his love and compassion towards his friend. No matter your views on immigration, it should be handled at the state and federal level, not Oxford Area School District. Our district should focus on educating all students in our district. Jennifer Keyes also many times during the last two meetings mentioned that the community needed to know when homeless or undocumented children are accepted to our school. Why? Why does she need to know that? I urge our administration to not disclose any personal or identifiable student information to any member of the school board, especially if there's a risk that they will disclose that information to the public. There are far more serious issues 
that warrant being brought to the community's attention and a child's immigration status is not one of them. As I end this, I will leave you with the words of Giselle Barreto Fetterman, the second lady of Pennsylvania, addressing Jennifer Key's comments. Fetterman said, and I quote, as someone who was one of those people and who grew up as an undocumented child, I can only imagine what my outcome would have been had the school board members actively been rooting against my success. Good people of Oxford, please run for school board, end quote. And with that, I once again ask Jennifer Keyes to resign. I'm going to take this time right now uh, just to correct incorrect comments. Normally we stay silent, we listen, uh, but this has been an ongoing issue. Uh, first off, to compare our district with a website, speaking to Mrs. Weicker's comments of greatschool.org, we're not familiar with those websites. As I think you saw today uh, or this evening at this meeting, Assistant Superintendent Billings-Jones uh, laid out the good things that are happening in this school district according to our state standardized test scores. Additionally, I'd like to address the administration raises that was given an incorrect percentage far above what any of my colleagues, Mr. Cooney or Dr. Billings-Jones or myself actually make. And third, the evaluation is a compilation and you could go back to the almost 10 years that I was here the compilation is from a detailed evaluation. The compilation is what is required by state code, and I believe those compilations have proficient throughout the uh, compilation for the balance of the years. So I'm taking this time just to correct some incorrect statements uh, because they've been occurring, and I believe that we need to add a voice to the correct statements, so thank you for indulging me. Thank you, Ms. Bolger, for your comments. Uh, Ms. Ronnie Klutz. Good evening. My name is Ronnie Lutz. I'm from East Nottingham Township. And I'm here this evening in the presence of witnesses to serve Mr. Robert Tanga with a letter of intent to file claim against his surety bond for violating 13 federal and international codes Firstly, we cite examples of board actions that are at the least of good judgment in its responsibilities to ensure the welfare of children and families at most are in legal opposition to their oaths of office and stated governing responsibilities and authorities. Most of the school board members voted December 7 to recommit for an additional six months to the required federal health and safety plan that is attached to the ESSER three funding. Funding which forfeits the children and parents' constitutional rights and the right of parents to make decisions regarding their children's medical health and or treatment. Superintendent Woods violated federal and state application requirements for ESSER three by ESSER three funding by not engaging stakeholders prior to submitting the application. School board members voted forward and moved forward and voted on health and safety plan without exercising their own due diligence on this family impacting critically important plan placed before them for enactment. 
School board members did not demand and were indeed denied access by Superintendent Woods to the proposed health and safety plan prior to the meeting at which it was voted upon. School board members did not vote to table the t vote on the health and safety plan, so s the new school board members could have an opportunity to inform themselves of the details of the plan. Director Klaus voted for the plan without having read it. Director Dean threatened stakeholders with pushbacks for speaking out in opposition. School board members should be held accountable for its approval of superintendent's annual review and subsequent salary re increases, which over uh, have been from $152,000 at hiring to a current $227,000, with at the very least test scores of students have plummeted 40%. Secondly, we cite the, exam the following examples of gross misconduct, incompetence, and or neglect of duty on the part of Superintendent Woods relating to the health and safety plan and homeless policy 7320 revisions. Superintendent offered to fool stakeholders by suggesting there be two health and safety plans, one for submission to the federal government that would carry the authority to take action against the children and families, and one that would satisfy the stakeholders. This is a gross infraction, infraction of his lawful duties. Superintendent Woods withheld the information that the 21 high school homeless students were placed by Homeland Security. The school board did not update the homeless policy 7320 as recommended in the homeless monitoring audit of April 21st, April 2021, and must do so now to comply with federal ESSA updated ver verbiage to make acceptance of these 21 high school homeless students allowable. Superintendent Woods requested that the board approve his being made the sole party responsible for the homeless students that attend Oxford Area High School. Voters elect school board members from within our community for a reason, to offer balance, integrity, and perspective when approaching all matters relating to the education of our district's children. To, do, minute, to do as suggested, making Mr. Wood's sole overseer of a particular block of students would prevent the school board members from performing their own required duties, holding them in conflict with their oaths of office and descriptions of responsibilities. That which would be even uttered to the board for suggestion for consideration speaks volumes to superintendent's overall intent and lack of character. This would allow for achievement standards appear greater than they truly are. Such an overreach supplements the school board's authority and goals of governing and combined with above mentioned shortfalls is sufficient to demand his immediate removal. Mr. Ty in his letter to the community contributed to and perpetrated the vilification and created racist narrative Thank you, Ms. Lutz. Jim Shaw. Oh, Mr. Shan. <coughs> Hi, my name is Jim Shan. I'm from East Nottingham Township. I have a little thing written here, and I don't know whether I'm going to read it or not, or whether I'm just going to take up your time, because I want you to know that this is never going to go away. Ms. Keys, you are a stain on our school and our community. Uh, and I know I'm supposed to address you. I'll look at you, but just so we're aware. Okay, okay. Well, unfortunately, so I'll talk to you. You guys are all going to have to suffer because of this. You see this crowd. We are not going anywhere. So everyone can get used to these long meetings and, and people being here all night long. Um, I, I can't even imagine that it's up for question that the wife of a pedophile is on our school board. There, uh, it is factual. You're, you're understand, understood. Then we'll just go with, you are clearly a xenophobe. You uh, have no business making any decision for any child. Please, you. We're, you address me and please just stay away from any name calling. I'm just going to, 
I'm just going to stand here for the next three and a half minutes. If anybody was willing to stand with me uh, who wants to see Miss uh, Keys resign, please do so now. We're just going to be here for the next three and a half minutes, folks. I appreciate you standing with me. make sure the whole community gets to see that. One minute, Mr. Shan. Thank you, sir. We can and will do this as long as you keep your seat. And to all of you, I hope you have the day you deserve. Thank you, Mr. Shan. Lizzie Evans Ralston. Hi. Um, hello, Mr. Tahi. Uh, Ty? Ty. And uh, Mr. Woods. Cool. Uh, my name is Lizzie Evans Ralston, and I'm a resident of Oxford Borough West. Got it right this time. As well as a junior at Oxford Area High School. I have lived and attended school in the Oxford Area School District for my entire life and I am incredibly thankful for the opportunities it has provided me. I've been accepted into the ATP program. Um, I achieved high grades and am, achieving, and am achieving high grades and challenging myself in various AP classes and applying myself in new ways to the music department and various extracurricular activities. I have been able to succeed and grow as a student. 
And I could not be more thankful for the opportunities I have and the way in which my wonderful teachers have challenged me in order to further my education. It is because of this school district that I remain who I am today, which is why I was so heartbroken to hear the comments made at the last school board meeting. The thought of another student being denied the same opportunities that I have simply because of something as trivial as perceived test scores is abhorrent and absolutely unjust. The students being accused all came to America to have opportunities and all students deserve a right to an education. All children deserve to be given a, a, a chance to succeed. It is appalling that someone could look at any child and blame them for low test scores, all while suggesting that perhaps because of the hand they have been dealt, they don't deserve the same opportunities that I have been given as someone who has opted out of almost every standardized test those scores are based on. So I have earned a zero on every score those tests I have. They have all earned higher scores than I will ever have on any of those tests. Um, besides the keystones I had to take to graduate. It is one of my core beliefs that if the right to education is not given to one of us, it is not given to all of us. And as long as I'm concerned, those students are members of the Oxford Area School District and they are my friends, my classmates, and my equals. No matter who they are, no matter where they came from, and no matter how they came here, they deserve exactly what I have been given because they are students too. And I don't feel comfortable going to a school whose board upholds these opinions because this is a representative body that does not represent the core values of me or many of my classmates, the people who actually attend the schools that you reflect, make decisions on, be on behalf of, and are supposed to ally with and support. In fact, all of us have learned at one point or another about Thomas Paine, the revolutionary author of Common Sense and a founding father of these United States, who helped spur the American Revolutionary War, in which, you may recall, we earned our independence for Britain almost 200 years ago. Well, a little over 200 years ago. It was he who said, whatever is my right as a man is also the right of another and it becomes my duty to guarantee as well as to possess. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ralston. Is it Evans Ralston or Ralston? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Evans Ralston. Andrea Evans. Good evening, Mr. Woods and Mr. Ty. So Lizzie's my daughter. <laughs> and um, I don't know if I can talk that, Lizzie, but I just wanted to put in my two cents. Um, thank you for taking the time to allow me to speak. My name is Andrea Evans. I'm a resident of Oxford Borough West and a parent of both an alumni and a current student of the school district. In fact, many people present tonight know my kids because they have both taken advantage of the many opportunities offered through the school district. Indeed, there are people present in this very room tonight who have nurtured, challenged, and encouraged my children on their journey through an academic life paved with opportunity. As a mother, I am close to the end of this journey. Imagine as a mother the fury of hearing elected representatives espouse a belief that not all students should be treated the same that a targeted group of children would be treated in a manner excluding them from the opportunity that my children benefited from. Opportunity that allowed my own children to flourish, as you've seen here tonight more than once. So of course, mothers of those targeted children, I feel your fury, and that is why I'm here tonight. School board directors, among you are directors not invested in being the stewards of opportunity for all of the students in the Oxford Area School District. Their message is strongly worded with terms like, pretend to care about the students. Let that sink in. Pretend to care about the students. Think about that the next time you're pouring over policy at night, that that is what's being said. Pretend to care about these students, my children, our children. If you as directors truly care about our students and want them on a journey to journey on a path forged with opportunity, stand with us furious mothers and fathers as we ask for the resignation of the directors not committed to the success of each and every child in the school district. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Evans. Mr. Jim Labor, 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 Jim Labor. Ms. Lauren Rubino. My name is Lauren Rubino from Lower Oxford Township. I hate public speaking. I despise it. While I was trying to decide if this was something I should do, my second grader told me about a new student in his school. He said they don't speak English and they're from another country. My son said, Mommy, that must be so scary. Oddly enough, he never mentioned test scores. My eight-year-old is able to recognize the turmoil that these children are going through, so I figured a few minutes of my own discomfort was worth it. I'm here for those students. I am a nurse. It is my job to take care of my patients. It does not matter who they are, what they look like, where they come from, or what language they speak. Their care is my responsibility. When I have a patient who does not speak English, I learn how to say hello and goodbye in their language. Why? Because I want them to feel welcome and safe during an uncertain time. While I do not speak their language, I want them to know that I accept them and my care for them will not falter due to the language barrier. It is my job to take care of all my patients the same way. All of the children of the Oxford Area School District are like your patients. It is your job to keep them safe and make sure that they get the education they deserve while they are in your care. It is your job to take care of all the students the same way, regardless of your opinions on how they got here. Some of you have shown through your recent actions that you don't see all of the students as your responsibility. Jennifer Kayes' comments at the January 18th meeting and the recent policy committee meeting have proven that where children come from is more important to her than their education. There are many issues with this, but the worst part is that it proves that she has failed to do her job. I have learned a lot of things in my 15-year career as a nurse. I've learned to do full assessments, learned to take vital signs, I've also learned hello and goodbye in a few different languages. So I ask you to follow my lead, Mrs. Case. Assess the situation in this room. Put your finger on the pulse of the community and learn to say adios. Thank you, Ms. Rubino. Um, I'm sorry, it looks like Owen Aliito. All right. <coughs> How do I pronounce that? Alioto. Yes, Alioto is correct. Thank you. Um, I am Owen. I'm a high school senior at Oxford Area High School. And I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, as a student at Oxford Area High School, I remember one image very clearly. It was a black and white uh, picture from the 50s of a white protester screaming in the face of a black child holding a sign. I don't remember the exact words of it, but the message was clear. You are not welcome here. That picture is still being published in books and put up in museums across America. And that's how those people will be remembered forever. Ms. Keyes, this is how you will be remembered forever. By saying you are not welcome to the, to the Latina children of our community. I'd, ask, I'd like you to think about that. Thank you, Mr. Alito. Jill Gallagher. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Jill Gallagher. I have two children enrolled in the school district. I live in East Nottingham Township, and um, 
Tonight, I'm here to ask Jennifer Case to resign. Um, it would seem like Jennifer is merely a soldier in her husband's incursion. They have started a group called the Oxford Area Patriots, where they meet at their church and they discuss issues, which I'm not sure because they discuss them in private, not with all stakeholders, which is actually against the district's policy as far as the bylaws go. I have some uh, photographs I have printed up off of Facebook, different comments regarding their group, and I have our district's policy. And I have a violation of five different policies in our bylaws from the comments that she had made at the January 18th meeting that she said again at the February 8th meeting and that her husband has posted online. I feel like she has surrendered her responsibility to the school board by posting online under her husband's name, which there is an example here, I will give this to you guys, to look over. If she still refuses to resign, I am asking that the school board please review this and make sure that she is not in violation of any more bylaws. Before I close out my speech, I would like to address Mr. Blessington. I, um, I have not found anything. Okay, well, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I would just like to say that I haven't found anything as far as breaking the rules go, but I have seen enough to make my stomach turn, and I'm just begging you to be more sensitive and thoughtful in the future with your public image and the words that you use. Um, kids first, progress, and most importantly, unity is what we should be here for. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gallagher. Amanda Jackson. Hi. My name's Amanda Jackson. I'm from West Nottingham Township. I've been a taxpayer and I've voted in our district for almost 30 years. I voted for Jen Kays in our last local election and I wanted to stand up and show some support for her. Um, a few meetings ago, she did what she was elected to do, and that was to ask hard questions. Since then, I've watched some local Facebook groups with self-elected administrators allow a steady stream of online bullying of Jen and her family to take place. And not just Jen and her family, but actually anyone who attempted to speak up in her defense. My guess is that none of these people who are currently enraged and highly offended on social media and actually here today uh, voted for Jen. These are probably people who opposed her from the beginning. The comments that she made a few meetings ago were taken out of context and misconstrued into something that they unfairly framed as racist. This group of Facebook administrators used their local moms and Oxford message board social media platforms to push their personal political agendas. They started a change.org petition that got thousands of signatures, and that sounds really impressive, except most of those signatures were from people who don't live in Oxford. After having several conversations with a handful of local people about the, the Jen Kay's incident, I would ask them, do you really think Jen was insinuating that poor students and immigrant students aren't smart? Yes. No. Yes. Or, thank you. And we will not have that type of outburst, please. Thank you. Um, I would also ask them, if they felt like she really thought that Oxford should not provide an education for them, or that she is a flat-out racist. All of the responses were, no, actually. So everyone understood the point that she was attempting to make at that meeting, but their issue was that her word choice was bad when referring to the specific groups of children as those people. So this is the precedence we are allowing in our community.
that regardless of intent, a poor choice of words will ignite a smear campaign on social media. It will spark investigations into your extended family members, and most importantly, it now justifies online harassment and bullying. Even just as a public supporter of Jen's, I have found myself being a target of online bullying. People were leaving comments on my Facebook page from Texas, from Kentucky, even from Poland, okay, in response to Jen Keys. I've had a man pull pictures of my family to make a viral TikTok video presenting me as a racist. So I can only imagine the nightmare that Jen and her family have been put through. And for what? For asking hard questions? For a poor use of words? As parents, we encourage our children to be strong and be bold and to take a stand against bullying when they see it. And that's why I came here to support Jen tonight. Our children are watching. Why do kids bully? It's because they see adults bullying. That's why. So as a board, you need to focus on the needs of our students and educators in the school system, not hyper-focus on a poor choice of words or the opinions of a few social media groups. You need to allow for hard, uncomfortable questions to be asked and realize that each of you are here and elected from people who live in your school district. Not people in Kennett, not people in Avangrove, not people in Rising Sun, but Oxford voters. So please, stop the bullying, support one another, ignore the social media hype, and just focus on getting the work done. And I have to say, I am so disappointed that you would allow that nonsense that happened to actually occur. And to me, that was bullying on your part. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mrs. Jennifer Warren and Mr. Kevin Warren are on the list, but I do believe you wanted to speak just at the agenda, beginning of the agenda. Okay. Oh. Mr. Kevin Warren. <coughs> Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm Kevin Warren. I'm in Elk Township. Uh, it's my understanding that some directors have changes they want to make to the health and safety plan and also that having an adequate safety plan is a requirement for the ESSER grant. Uh, as an engineer, one of the ways we make sense of complex problems is to define the project uh, boundaries that we're dealing with. And one of the, what are the outcomes that we absolutely need? You know, what are the, the really requirements? And then what are the uh, other benefits that would be nice to have? Um, so say we're discussing, you know, we're building a new school. The nice to haves would be things like minimizing the construction cost or having better vocational facilities. And these kinds of things are often in conflict. It's a balancing act where we're, you know, getting feedback from stakeholders. People feel passionately about different sides of it. And you've got to evaluate those trade-offs. But unlike the nice-to-haves, any project has a list of you know, strict requirements, the must-haves. Uh, beyond just meeting the requirements of the law, those would include meeting the requirements of different funding sources. So for that new school, uh, you know, we could be getting a grant as long as we comply with best practices, say, around the American with Disabilities Act. You might have, of course, you know, your local QAnon Karen who read that the ADA was you know, some kind of plot, but as long as it was cost effective, any professional would meet those grant requirements and take the money. Now, where the supplies is, you know, I think most of you, when you're looking at the health and safety plan, are trying to find that balance between competing objectives. Right? On the one side, we've got this objective of minimizing dangers to the vulnerable in our community. On the other side, there's the objective of minimizing inconvenience to students and to families that are created from safety measures like masks and quarantines. But you also need to keep in mind those strict requirements. And I think in this case, it's complying with the federal requirements. Otherwise, you could jeopardize that $6 million that Oxford cannot afford to lose. There's nothing really very complex about that, except I think we have some stakeholders where rejecting the grant is the goal. They want Oxford to make this huge financial sacrifice in order to further some imagined war against tyranny. No logical justification is provided for jeopardizing this money. Only a string 
of slippery slope fallacies. Now, I'm confident that none of you believe that the CDC could decide to seize our children and keep them in prison for 10 days, or that George Soros is behind all of this recent concern in the community, or that children need to have supplies in case they're imprisoned for days, or that the, co the county might use <clears throat> our parking lots to force children to be vaccinated. I think you all know that these arguments are not logical reasons to put $6 million in jeopardy. Maybe there is a logical argument for jeopardizing that money, but I have not heard it yet. And this is not a conservative versus liberal or a Democrat versus Republican issue. This is an issue of staying grounded in rational reality rather than indulging in paranoid delusions. I'm not implying that any of you buy into that sort of thinking, but I'm here because there's a danger in hearing something over and over. It can become normalized, and pretty soon the unthinkable becomes thinkable. Please don't let it. In your debate about the plan, work to find a balance between the objective of safety and the objective of convenience. I think everyone in this room would find a different balance, but you'll be doing your jobs well as long as you focus on finding that balance while you stay within the federal requirements for the grant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Is that a J, Janelle Dewars? Davies? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. It's okay. There's a reason I typed this. Good evening, Mr. Ty and members of the board. My name is Tennille Dewees. I reside in Upper Oxford Township. I'm a mother of four students in this district, and though I don't regularly attend board meetings, I am otherwise fully immersed in their educational experience here in Oxford. I won't bore you with the list. It might take five minutes. <laughs> I loosely uh, follow what's going on in this board, but have mostly felt that I could trust that our board has the best interest of students at heart. When I've stepped in and written letters to the board on several occasions and attended a handful of meetings, mostly via Zoom, it has always been with a concern for equitable education for all students. To understand why that's so important to me, you may be interested to know that I have spent every spring and summer since 2010 running the Nottingham Presbyterian Church back to school fair. We have given between 300 and 900 to 1,000 students a year their grade-specific school supplies that are needed. Um, on that day, we have also, the kids have also sometimes walked away with a new haircut, um, new to them clothes, and access to family resource agencies on the spot. Um, I'm sorry. I've met families who've just arrived to our community, and sometimes with the help of an interpreter, sometimes through their own children, sometimes struggling really hard to remember my Spanish three from high school. <laughs> um, I have been proud to welcome them to their new hometown as neighbors with open arms. Really, as parents, all we needed were our eyes to communicate that all we really want for our, is the best for our kids. This is the attitude most everyone I know has as well. I didn't need a law telling me that I couldn't ask questions to know that our neighbors deserve dignity, respect, and an education for their children that was free of prejudice. I thought this was the attitude of our board, and I honestly believe that it was until the last election. And now I find it my duty to make sure that our board understands this is the expectation. We may not always be out in force for every meeting, but we are paying attention. We are involved parents, and we care about all the students of OIC. Oxford Area School District receiving a free education. In continuing my focus on equitable education for all, I'd like to ask you to seriously consider the impact any changes to our current health and safety plan may have on our ability to receive much needed ESSERS Grant three funding. I understand that we're to hear, we heard the results of the online survey from stakeholders about how that funding could be used. But I'm curious about what other means of surveys surveying our parents, how our parents feel about health and safety have taken place. For instance, has a survey been taken of students who continue to voluntarily mask at school? I think it could pretty easily be done just with homeroom teachers. 
I had my three students do it. Well, I have four students, but getting my second grader to count kids in his class and remember it by the time he got home wasn't happening. Um, <laughs> my fifth grader had 70% of her class continuing to mask. My ninth grader out of the 80, uh, 87 out of 122 students in her classes were masking, that's 71%. My 10th grader had 53%. And if I pull them all together, it was about 62% for my students, my children, and the exposure that they're having at school with masks. Since an online survey is only as good as the engagement it receives, I hope that you'll consider doing your own formal study of how our students, and by extension their families, feel about masking health and safety. From what my family has observed, it appears as though the majority of our minute, students are still choosing to wear masks. So while the people not in favor of taking common sense safety measures during a pandemic may loudly object and come out in stronger numbers to speak against it, I wonder if this simple survey would give you a better glimpse into the minds of our entire student body and their families. We are not a school district that's able to turn away additional funding, as has been highlighted in the current Pennsylvania Supreme Court Fair Education Funding Lawsuit, which identifies our school district among the top 100 underfunded school districts in the state. Now, I personally don't care about test scores. But for those that do, I'd say that our poor funding is a much greater factor in test scores than a few immigrant children deserving of an education. It is also immediately actionable as we can receive this funding just by maintaining a health and safety plan. Please don't let the loud few take this funding away from our schools. I see this money as a way to free up our budget so we can get some of those Thank you, Ms. Dewees. Elizabeth Dewees. Good evening, Mr. Ty and board. I'm Elizabeth Dewees. I resigned in Upper Oxford. I'm currently a sophomore at the high school. I've been a student of the district since kindergarten. I've never heard anyone say anything like what Ms. Keyes said at the board meeting on January 18th. I can proudly say that my peers have all been accepting of new students every year. Sometimes teachers need to slow down to explain things to other students, but that's not always because of a language barrier. Often, I am the student holding up the class because I need extra help, instruction, or explanation. But I won the, birth, the birthplace lottery being born in this town, so my need for extra help does not seem to concern you. None of my peers have ever shown frustration at my or any other student's need for assistance. Since the unfound comment that Ms. Keyes made publicly at the board meeting and showcased on the social media, there has been a divide in our school. Students seem emboldened to make marks about, to make horrific comments about our Latinx students that they have never made before. Prior to the last few weeks, I've never heard any of these comments from a student, teacher, or board member in my 11 years of going to Oxford Area School District. Frankly, I'm appalled by the remarks Ms. Keyes made about some of the students attending our school district, including the accidental slip-up she made during the February 8th meeting, repeating these students again, with a smirk on her face. I'm personally privileged to be attending school with every one of my peers. I can't imagine being put in the position that Ms. Keyes has placed many families of this district. All children deserve an education, no matter what. In closing, I'd like to, I'd like to note that I'll be voting I'll be a voting age in two years and want to thank two of our most, mostly, sorry, excuse me, two of our most newly elected board members for teaching me the importance of participating in every election and getting to know each candidate before I head out, of the, head out to the polls. Like Lizzie Evans Ralston, I'm opted out of standardized testing, so I have, too, received zeros on all of those test scores. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dewees. Charles Vicky? Um, hello, I'm Charles Vickery from the Borough of Oxford. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Um, an Oxford Area School District board member has disparaged homeless children as illegals, blamed them for low district rankings, and sought to memorialize these types of derogatory terms 
uh, in policies meant to protect them. These stereotype threats have detrimental effects on students' performance and well-being. Based on 35 years raising a family here, the 73,000 people to date who have petitioned for the board member's resignation are the people who overwhelmingly reflect our community. The U.S. Supreme Court in Plyler versus Doe disproved 40 years ago the myth that children who were not legally admitted into the United States negatively impact the quality of education for other students. Found that every child in the United States, regardless of legal status, is a protected person under the 14th Amendment. And found that the deprivation of education takes an inestimable, inestimable toll on the social, economic, intellectual, and psychological well-being of the individual and poses an obstacle to an individual's achievement. Again, the education system is central to a child's well-being. The McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act, behind District Policy 7320, guarantees equal access to public education for homeless students. The district served 112 homeless students in the 2019-20 school year, up from 111 students the prior year, the highest numbers in the decade. The only focus of Policy 7320 on tonight's agenda should be to provide students with every opportunity to succeed. There should be no confusion about district rankings relative to race, ethnicity, disability, primary language, or socioeconomic status. As stated earlier, the Pennsylvania Department of Education publishes performance assessments within each of these subgroups for every district and school in the state. Our district of just over 27,000 people includes an established and growing Hispanic population. One in six district residents are Hispanic, one in three Oxford Borough residents are Hispanic. Our district, I'm sorry, please remain focused on the mission of the Oxford Area School District to have all students achieve academic excellence in a safe and nurturing environment. Reject and expose stereotypical misinformation presented in the guise of inquisitiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vickery. Ms. Gloria Stefani Lopez. Hello, um, and hi to everyone here tonight. My name is Gloria Stephanie Lopez. Most people know me as Stephanie. I'm a resident of East Nottingham Township, and I have a child in the district, and soon it will be two children. So recently, I came across a quote that in reality, I believe, summarizes what we're discussing today at hand. And that quote was, anything blocking our community from education is an enemy to our progress. I'll say it again. Anything blocking our community from education is an enemy to our progress. So Ms. Keys, and to anyone on the board for that matter that shares the same xenophobic views and decides to block any child from an education and thus the progress of our community is our enemy. I would like to remind you that the United States Supreme Court issued a decision in Plyer versus Doe in 1982 that declared states cannot deny students a free public education on the account of their immigration status. The ruling was based upon the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. The court reasoned that resources saved by excluding undocumented children from schools were far outweighed by the harm to America's progress. That, Ms. Keys, and to the board, is the law. Neither you or I or anyone in the audience, for that matter, is above the law. It is the United States way and what America stands for. You may not exclude an immigrant child, legal or, in your words, illegal from entering our district. You and the board are prevented from releasing student education records, including information about their immigration status. And this is all under the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act. And since you'd like to do research, you could have done that research. Anyway, referring back to my initial quote, the definition of an enemy, Ms. Keys, and the board is a person who is actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. And Ms. Keys, or should I say Mr. Keys, 
You have shown your hostility toward a group of children time and time again, not only through your words, but through your actions, through social media posts, and also a few other of you guys, but I'm not going to go there. The responsibility, your responsibility is to act on behalf of all children in our district. And there is a lot to desire for how you have fulfilled your position as of right now. Today, Mrs. Keys and the board, as you place your eyes upon the audience, realize that you have more adversaries than you do have allies. Today, I will wrap up my speech by letting you know that this will not simply die down as you have been quoted. The community has too much to lose by letting you remain in a position that oversees the welfare of all children in our community. I ask you today again, Ms. Keys, to resign from your position. Take a step back and realize the damage that you have already done to our community. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Personnel, Mr. Woods. Thank you. I'd like to recommend the attached list of professional personnel. Do I have a motion to approve the attached list of professional personnel? Motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Non professional, Mr. Woods. I recommend the attached list of non professional personnel. Can I have a motion to accept the attached list of non professional personnel? Motion. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Volunteers, Mr. Woods? I recommend the attached list of volunteers. Do I have a motion to approve the attached list of volunteers? Motion. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Consent agenda. Be it resolved that the Oxford Area Board of School, by School Directors hereby approves the following consent agenda items. Section 1302 two students. Students named on the attached list to be considered resident of the school district for the 2021-2022 school year in accordance with Section 1302 of the Public School Code. High School Course Selection Guide. Approval of the course selection guides for Oxford Area High School for the 2022-23 school year as per attached. Oxford Area High School 10 to 12. Oxford Area High School incoming ninth grade. 2022-2023 school calendar. Approval of the 22-23 school year calendar. Do I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? <coughs> we move section D, so on to section E. Health and safety plan. Be it resolved that the Oxford Area Board of School Directors hereby approves the dra draft changes of the District Health and Safety Plan template for the ARPESSER Fund, American Rescue Plan Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Do I have a motion? Discusses after the motions. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second? Discussion. So I have a comment to make on the health and safety plan. The revisions in this document, I believe, still are not adequate. The fact that this money has strings attached to it remains a problem. Are we prepared to have the government dictate to us what we could do in our district? Is this really the best choice for our students? I know that in this plan, we are allowing the Chester County Health Department or the state, if they decide to relinquish their rights to the state, to choose what is best for the children in this district, for the students in this district, <coughs> rather than giving that right to the parents. I still feel strongly that we should not be accepting this money in exchange for our students' rights or freedoms. We as board members took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. And as far as, I'm, as, far as I know, the Constitution still stands for freedom. The freedom of our students should <coughs> never be for sale, no matter how much is promised by the government.
I am in favor of the, the plan, uh, but I would like to see some changes to the plan. Um, specifically, there's, uh, there's three changes that I uh, would like to propose and have put, put forth. Uh, one is the uh, under uh, section one, LEA governing body will, uh, it currently says authorize the chief school administrator to implement uh, the approved plan, <clears throat> excuse me, to coincide with changes by the Chester County Department of Health as needed. And I uh, had requested to strike out and have it read as the LEA governing body will implement uh, the approved changes by the Chester County Department of Health as needed. And what that does is it keeps the, uh, the board in charge of any changes that need to happen. My second proposal is under A, 3A, uh, which is universal and correct wearing of masks. Currently we have um, one, two, three, four, almost five pages of uh, things that we say we will do uh, in starting with uh, mask face coverings uh, must be worn by all uh, non-students school staff, visitors, uh, and it, it goes on. And, and my proposal to change that is in line with uh, one of the other districts in our uh, county, which um, the wording can be, again, tweaked either way, but it says uh, where required by law, proper masking and face shield uh, can be used, uh, be discussed with, used and discussed with those wearing such on school property and on buses, and obviously, uh, the question that I've received on the buses is, is it is a mandate currently, even though that we have removed it uh, as a mandate within the school and have left it up to the parents. And my goal behind this is to do the same. Uh, I'd like to see the parents be able to control, uh, unless there's a law mandating it for us, uh, the parents to have that choice on whether or not they put a mask uh, on their child. And the way that this is written currently um, as long as it's recommended, we would then then or could be uh, locked in as other districts uh, within our, in our county currently are. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Oxford uh, up until, was it today, uh, was the, the only one that Dr. Rare dumped yeah. theirs, right? Um, was the only one that had removed the masking mandate and gave the parents the choice um, back in December. And I believe that now there are other districts uh, doing such, Avangrove, Kennett, Unionville, uh, on the 28th of February. So I'm, I'm not really sure what the magic date there is, but uh, again, I, I'm in favor of the, the parents making that choice. The other recommendation uh, change that I have is under the putting the uh, vaccination clinic in the school, <clears throat> excuse me. And my recommendation there was to, the LEA will provide information regarding offsite clinics providing medical care, <clears throat> excuse me, for those that inquire any emergency use of OASD facilities in no way assumes any implied consent uh, by any in individual. Uh, and then there's another addition um, yeah, that one there. Um, to that, and I don't know if we can do it tonight, but the other one is uh, an Avangrove uh, piece that basically states that um, there'll be no mandate. <coughs> this one here. County resources, excuse me one second, I just gotta find it. Okay, vaccinations for staff and students will not be required <clears throat> for attendance or employment. Um, so I, I think that kind of covers uh, that piece. Uh, and then the last one was the physical distancing. Um, it just kind of cleans up the, the verbiage that's there already and says any physical distancing required by law 
uh, can be followed by the district to the fullest extent possible to allow con uh, continuation of in-person learning. So they were the uh, proposed changes that uh, I would like to put forward. Mr. Patterson, uh, the changes that you requested, where you have where required by law in a couple of these situations, you say where required by law, proper masks maybe can be used or what have you can be discussed. Could we put uh, where required by law, not mandated, because mandates are not laws? in each of those sections. I think that if the board decides to move forward with the with the ESSER plan, health and safety plan, uh, that would be more clear. I have one other suggested change and it's under item 3G where you're talking about an emergency use of Oxford Area School District facilities in no way assumes implied consent by any individual. I think it should also say, and shall not be available for vaccination purposes during normal school hours. Under no circumstances shall vaccines be administered to students under the age of 18 without both parents or legal guardians present. Currently under PA law, um, implied consent is not allowed. Uh, there has to be parental consent, so that's covered. Um, the reason that I put the implied consent piece there under the emergency use of the facility um, is because there's different governance when there's an emergency, and I just wanted to cover um, any confusion there. But as far as regular uh, school day or uh, under regular law, that's not possible. If I can, here, I just want to read it. Here's some language that's um, currently in a, another district in our county. Uh, it's in their approved plan for those uh, that may be concerned that the verbiage uh, being recommended may put it in jeopardy. And the verbiage under the universal and correct wearing of masks, it says masks will be, be required if required by law or governmental directive. When masks are required by law, or gov governmental directive, the district will comply with all applicable requirements of such law or government uh, directive. Um, so I think that kind of covers and, and assures that that verbiage um, has been accepted. So I think we have an argument if they choose not to accept our verbiage um, that it's already been accepted in another district's health and safety plan. The request of Mr. Woods, I'll read the rest of uh, what's under this. It says, additionally, medical guidance issued by the Chester County Health Department, PA Department of Education, and or CDC will be strongly considered when determining whether masks will be required. The administration is authorized to implement now this is where their piece is, is down here that uh, I wanted to recommend the change up on the front end. Uh, it says uh, the administration is authorized to implement 
the health department, uh, PA health department, or Chester County health department's guidance as applicable. Face coverings will be available for staff and students, although individuals are expected to provide their own. Information related to proper mask etiquette will be shared <clears throat> to assure that mouth and nose are covered with no gaps between the face and masks. Uh, mask breaks for students will be provided in accordance with CDC, PA Department of Health, Education should the district adopt a mask optional approach. Unvaccinated staff will be required to wear masks and commit to weekly antigen testing. So that's not stuff that I'm recommending. It was the first part of that because that doesn't have anything to do with what, what we're doing. Yeah, the circle to here. Yep. None of the antibody testing and, and so, forth. so I just still want to make um, one more point is that I think we really should um, think about where we reference the Chester County Department of Health. During this pandemic, the Chester County Department of Health gave up their rights to the state. And I think that that's important to understand when we put that in here, that the reason why we couldn't make a different decision, even if we wanted to, was that the Chester County Department of Health had relinquished their rights. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that because I was... So, sorry, I was just um, saying that I would strike through the Chester County Department of Health where you have it listed in the document, I would not include the Chester County Department of Health as the source for our decision making. And the reason for that is because during the pandemic, they gave up their rights to the state and it was no longer a decision made by the Chester County Department of Health. Mr. I think Woods, as a district, do these changes we keep that, that we're oh, I'm sorry. looking at, do you think that they um, jeopardize the funding? <laughs> so uh, <coughs> to be clear, and that's what Mr. Patterson and I were discussing, uh, what's proposed in green in a change, I think, needs to go further. In, in most of what he read. And I believe that under masking would be fine uh, as far as the grant funding is concerned. Because again, I want to point out to you uh, at the top column of two, sorry, 3A, where it says ARPS or requirement, universal and correct, correct wearing of masks, the strategies, policies, and procedures for that. So I need I need some strategies and procedures. Whether we're wearing them or not is not the issue. The issue is the second, if you were to look at the language in green, it needs to go further in my estimation to include what that other school district included. Uh, alternatively, as I made my recommendations over the last several months, I believe it could include the language although more verbose, in what we have in our plan right now. And again, that's not, if we follow the history within these health and safety plans, <coughs> the Oxford Area School District made masking recommended to start the school year and came under a mandate and then went back to masking required. And when that mandate was lifted by the Supreme Court in December, we reverted back to the health and safety plan. So there's no point, there's no point in time that we did not follow our health and safety plan because we were recommending masks. Now, to capitulate, it is verbose. It is looking, it is taking into account all uh, facets of if a mandate were to come back on or a lawfully called mandate were to come back on. 
And this, I believe, hits all the boxes for the grant and for a comprehensive health and safety plan. Again, I would capitulate that in 3A, under universal and correct wearing of masks, the additional language that Mr. Patterson read should be included rather than just the green language that was added to this draft. Because that then gives us a strategy and a procedure, whereas the current language just required <coughs> by law, proper face and, and, and shields discussed with those wearing on school property would not give us those strategies and procedures. It's just a discussion, and I believe that could be kicked back based on we're going to discuss it with you rather than give you the uh, proper uh, instruction on how to wear it, et cetera, et cetera, as Mr. Patterson read into the record. Um, again, just that first part, not, not the other part about uh, vaccines and antigen testing. Uh, so if, if you could understand what I'm stating there, um, if I go through each change, I have no issue with the LEA governing body uh, implementing an improved plan. If you don't want myself to have the ability to implement a mandate without calling a meeting, that's fine. It's just we give three days notice and call a meeting and sit here and go over the plan. Beautiful. Um, as far as distancing um, in B, I believe that was the next change, right? Any physical distancing required by law can be followed by the district to the fullest extent possible, allowing the continuation of personal learning. Again, I agree with that statement. However, that doesn't give me a strategy or procedure, and that's why we list the three to six feet, et cetera. So are you following my logic on this? When devising it, I need to check all those boxes off to be successful in this application. The next change uh, is under E in contact tracing. Again, uh, we, I believe we kept in collaboration with Chester County Department of Health and just struck and follow plan. Any lawfully required reporting to Chester County, I believe that's fine. In G, uh, again, I believe that's fine. Uh, LEA provide information regarding off-site clinics providing medical. We don't have to be involved in an on-site plan. So I don't see any problem with that uh, changing. And in uh, I, coordination with state and local health officials, uh, I think that that would need to be changed just a hair. Uh, OASD may consider all lawful recommendations from state and lawful or state and health officials when implementing the plan. Um, I, I'm not sure you want to say may consider all lawful recommendations because a lawful mandate, for example, uh, we would have to do. So I, I would suggest maybe some language changes there. Um, and again, even if that later is called off by the Supreme Court, that's the, the uh, judicial process at work. But we're under that mandate until said judicial process comes to a conclusion. Again, just to state, if you want to reduce some of the language in the plan, that's not, uh, if, if we add some of the language, I think it, it will be successful. Uh, as I recommended over the last several several board meetings. I don't recommend a change to it because I think it's all encompassing. Well, it could be confusing, um, and, but I've, I've made those statements known uh, each time, I believe. So just so, so we're clear. Oh. I'm sorry. I, I, I just want to clarify um, just um, in regards to some of the other districts. They adopted it. So and just to be clear here, I know some folks have said that I, I approved the plan, didn't know I, I actually did my research before speaking and joining a board, um, like some others haven't done on this board. So before coming to board, I can tell that tell you that most districts adopted the plan from the CCIU. In that plan, it talked about masking based off of the different levels of infection in the county. We did not. 
if you look at our pl the plan that other board members adopted, it's minuscule compared to what other districts have. I don't feel comfortable taking a bits and pieces out of what they have and saying that we're doing with what they are because we're not. We've essentially redlined this whole document and we've put in purposeful ambiguity here as Mr. Woods has noted to say may. Like I'm okay with the whole parental choice thing. If you want to wear a mask, you don't want our mask, that's fine. But if we should put in here recommended and put in the procedures. You don't want to wear a mask, that's fine. If there's a federal mandate, you have to do it on transportation, put it in here. But all I see here is red flags. And frankly, Ms. Keys, if you don't want to adopt this, then don't have any say in it. We should go into executive committee under the guise of safety, work this damn thing out. And Ms. Keys, if you don't want to come because you just want to redline the whole damn thing, then don't show up. We come and we vote on it. It, it is getting absolutely exhausting and she's the one who did this. I talked about it earlier in this meeting. There's students who sat here the other day who talked about, in, instead of all this, they walk through, the one student, I walk through the hallway and I see trash cans collecting water, bathrooms not working, flights in the hallway. We're not addressing any of that because of this bullshit that she brought up. I'm sick of it. Call the executive, call exec committee. You can call exec committee under the guise of safety. We'll work this thing out and not, because we, guys, we can't work this out tonight. The public hasn't seen it. They, they don't even know what we're talking about. No decisions let's will try, be made. Let's try and slow no, down on the no, clapping so we can get some no stuff done here. No decisions will be made in, ex, in exec committee because we're not allowed to. We'll come out, we'll discuss it, we'll, we'll present it to the public and the next meeting we vote on it. And then we move on and we start focusing on some things to help this school and to fix some of those, those test scores that we just saw that frankly, they are declining. I, I'm like, guys, I came from another board from another district and I'm completely frustrated. We're not getting anything done, anything. We're, I'm done. Any further discussion? Sorry, real quickly, I just would like to say that um, the comments that I made, they did come from input from the community. They were um, emailed to the whole board, I believe. Um, so I just want to be clear that the items that I'm raising are not just my personal changes. These are uh, revisions that were informed by the community as per this plan. Thank you. you can save your national politics and partisan politics for outside of this district. I'm, I'm done with it. All right, I think our best course of action here is I'd like to make a motion that we table the health and safety plan. Do I have a motion? Second. The discussion, as far as I see it, is that we should actually have a special meeting, sit down, as Mr. Claus has presented, get this thing ironed out, release it for public comment, and then we can vote on it in a meeting after that. That sounds like a very wise course of action to take. That's my area of discussion. Is there any further discussion? All right, um, we have a motion to table on the floor. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And then what? Then I'm done, right? Uh, staff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. Policy revision, second reading. Mr. Woods. Thank you. Other <coughs> places is the second permutation of the policy. 
7320 homeless students up for discussion This is not something that we're voting on this evening. This is merely just some discussion on changes or comments to the second reading of policy number 7320. Is there any discussion? I think the only thing that I would like to raise is that this particular policy was not edited um, within the guidelines of our policy revision schedule. I know that it was stated that it was done based on the audit that was conducted but what I wanted to understand was what is the urgency of getting this done now when the audit was done back in April of 2021 I guess I, I just was wondering if it was so urgent to do why wasn't it done following that audit uh, <laughs> so we brought it in front of uh, the policy committee uh, in a timely fashion as we work through all the nuances of the recommendations and I'm not uncertain I don't have it in front of me right now when we actually received <coughs> the recommendations from the federal auditor it may have been that the audit was conducted in April of 2021 until we received the actual recommendations could have been later uh, and I'm unclear what that date is but we'll look to find that date and then obviously we recess for the uh, July the month of July and then we have uh, September October November uh, and I'm again unclear when we received those recommendations but uh, it was up for second reading at our January meeting we don't do any business at the reorganization in December so that means it would have been up for the first reading at the November meeting so it seems to me that if it was completed in April we probably received it uh, sometime in August and September and I've gone through uh, making the additions to the existing policy and got it in front of the board in a timely fashion but we'll get those dates for you mrs. keys thank you and then I just wanted to know why do we have a policy revision schedule if we revise policies outside of that schedule okay uh, good question so we have a policy revision schedule that takes each broad section of our policy um, over the years so it may be the 4,000 series in any given year the 5,000 series or the 6,000 series and each year we go through and look to revise any of those policies so that's one thing uh, the second answer is at any time uh, throughout uh, the year we can pick and choose policies like the homeless policy uh, to revise after we receive input from auditors or some of our other policies uh, there may be a mandate at the state that has changed or policy guidance from an organization that has changed or a law that may have changed that we need to then go and edit our policies and when we edit the actual policy it takes three readings if we edit administrative procedures of policy it just takes one reading did that answer your question yes thank you you bet any further discussion about policy 7320 copy the policies listed is available at the administrative building 125 bell tower lane Oxford PA for examination and comment policies can be viewed on the website at www.oxfordasd.org public is encouraged to stop in and read these policies or visit the website closing items correspondence mr. Cooney we have none any changes to the calendar before I go through it
Tuesday, March 8th, Facilities and Safety Committee, 6 p.m. Administrative Building. Tuesday, March 8th, Athletics and Student Activities Committee, 6.15 p.m. Administrative Building. Tuesday, March 8th, Policy Committee, 6.30 p.m. Administrative Building. Tuesday, March 8th, 2022, Work Session, 7 p.m. Administrative Building. Tuesday, March 15th, 2022, Budget and Finance Committee, 6.30 p.m. Administrative Building. Tuesday, March 25th, 2022, Regular Meeting, 7 p.m. Administrative Building. I'd like to, um, is anybody We'd be okay to have a executive session after the meeting on March 8th to discuss this health and safety plan so we can get something done. Anybody have any issues with that or can we all attend? Yes. Executive session March 8th. Hopefully, right around 8 p.m. on the administrative building. <coughs> oh, there you go. Follow up to community questions and concerns. Mr. Cooney, adjournment. Do I have a motion? motion. Second. Meetings adjourned. All in favor say aye. aye. Meetings adjourned.